Lee Radford, welcome to the In Touch podcast. How are things? Yeah, good, good. Um, pretty quiet at the moment. Um, certainly on the rugby front, um, just dealing with uh, recruitment and retirement, uh, but not in not in the cold face of obviously the results and, and games getting cancelled, which I'm, I'm pretty pleased about. I wanted to, to just take it all back sort of to the, the start for you, in, in particular 1998, a move to, to the Bradford Bulls from Hull Sharks, as they were known then, of course, Hull FC now, but your hometown club. How big a move was that for you at the time? Yeah, massive. It, it was a, a daunting move, if I'm, if I'm being brutally honest with you, but, you know, one that, a decision that, you know, I don't regret one, one bit. Um, at the time, you know, I tried to stay at Hull after already signing at Bradford, so um, I think they got 100 grand for me and, and that 100 grand, you know, saved the club going into liquidation from, from someone led to believe. So, um, yeah, it worked out well for both parties, I think. Mm. Of course, with the success that you went on to have at, at Bradford, it was really justified, wasn't it? I know you had one grand final defeat in there, but the ones that you won and the, the World Club Challenge, you must, looking back, it's a move that, although it was a difficult one, one that really paid off. Massively, yeah. And I don't, I don't think it was a an instant success. I think I didn't break the team, you know, week in, week out till I was maybe 22. So I had four years sort of in and out of the reserve team. Um, when I signed at Bradford, I'd, I'd literally just come out of the academy, the last year of academy. So, you know, I was a mainstay in the reserves for, for three or four years before actually cementing a spot, you know, within the, within the 13 and, Plenty of disappointment in there as well. You know, I missed out on I think a grand final, 18th man, a challenge cup, 18th man, and a, a World Cup challenge, 18th man as well. So, um, yeah, it, it paid off eventually. But yeah, there were some difficult times in there as well. What do those experiences as 18th man and, and the disappointment of it do for you, though? Do you go away and and straight away working on making sure that it doesn't happen again? Yeah, I think so. I think I think I. You know, some of them were soul destroying. The, the World Club Challenge, um, I actually got, you know, the day before, it was out with me and Brendan Costin who was going to be on the bench. Um, and Brian Noble had said, if it rains, he's going to go with the forward. If it's if it's dry, he's going to go with the back. And it, and it absolutely chucked it down all day. So I'm, you know, thanking the gods and assured that I'm going to be on the bench for that game against Newcastle Knights. And um, I actually got to the game from the bus from Hudson goes on the pitch to, to check what studs I'd need, 18 millis or 16 millis, or uh, got a tap on my shoulder and nobody told me I won't play in. So that was a that was a real tough one. Carl, you'll have dealt with disappointments like that, I'm sure, in, in your career. Always tough to take, particularly for such big games. Oh yeah, my my one was uh four Challenge Cup semi-finals, two, two at Bradford and we lost to Leeds and then when um, when Dean Bell and Huey wanted me to go to Leeds, I said the only reason I'm going to come. Obviously, my mates were there, Kevin and Kempy, but I wanted to uh, play in Challenge Cup final, so I went to Leeds and Bradford beat us twice. <laughs> so uh, you know, it must have been me, eh? But um, hey, Lee, that's a uh, that's massive, isn't it? You said you went from Hull to um, to Bradford for a hundred grand. You don't hear of that these days, do you? Hey, you know, in the, within the game, you know, getting good clubs, getting money to survive um, by selling a player and, and going to Bradford and just even to go into the reserves. You know, they must have fought massively about you, but it just doesn't happen anymore, does it? No, it's, it's becoming less frequent. I think um, I think it's no secret that the finances in the game probably are as, as strong as, as it once was. Um but yeah, it was a it was a huge amount at the time. I think at the time as well, Hull was a, was a selling club. I think that sold to be to Bradford as well the year before. Was at that time, I think he'd broke all the records for for try scoring at Hull, um, beating Gary Schofield with all his um, accolades that that he'd gained at the club. So at the time, we, it was a selling club. Um, but having said that, you know the the the. David Lloyd came in, you know, a little period after that, and and also spent some money. I think he brought Alan in, Alan Hunt in for hundred grand as well. So it, it went from sort of one extreme to the other. And then um, being at Bradford, obviously they were quite successful, weren't they? Did 
did you always think you were going to end up coaching? Was was it on your radar? I know you did a lot within business and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you're you're a very clever clever guy on that aspect, and you always looked after, you know. Probably what players don't really do now is is look out, try and look after themselves for after footy. But I know for a fact that you were, you know, busy in your your shops and all the other stuff you have in Hull. Um, did you always want to be a coach? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think um, my first coaching gig was at, at 20 and I took on East Hull under eights, I think it was, <laughs> and got involved with youth rugby at East Hull under eights and that, that side was a phenomenal team. I think we got eight kids signed professionally, um, which for an amateur club, you know, was was a, was a lot. Um, I think a couple went to Bradford, a couple went to Rovers. I think Scott Spavin played with you at Doncaster. Um, yeah. Obviously, Josh Hodgson, um, you know, went on to bigger and better things as well. So we, we, we had a, a really good side. And whilst coaching them through the age groups. I also got asked to do the open age as well. So I was actually coaching two teams, <laughs> a young side and an open age side, um, but, but really enjoyed it and, and, you know, aspired to be a coach pretty early on, I think. One should... And then you went to um, Hull, I um, got took in with Hull there uh, on the backroom staff. Were you still playing when you were doing that or...? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd done the scholarships at Hull for a couple of years, so... yeah. Um, as well as doing East stuff, so I was I was pretty busy. I went home much, um, but yeah, it's you know some of the kids that that came through all that you know your, your Reese Lins came through that scholarship, and so it was it was a good you know it was great grounding for any young aspiring coach, I suppose. Just going back to the Bradford days, obviously once you you had broken into the first team, and I think the the grand final win in in two thousand and three, of course, then. The, backed up by that World Club Challenge. What was that dressing room like to be a part of with some of the superstars you would have been playing alongside? Um, that, look, I, you know, I, I think two, two things you've got to have, you know, in, in any changing room. One, one, there's got to be hunger there. Um, you know, you've got to be chasing a dream. And I think we had plenty of blokes who, who um, you know, went after it as hard as they possibly could. With that, you know, there was very talented, don't get me wrong, but they, they trained as hard and, and worked as hard as anybody else in the competition at that time, you know, without a doubt. And I think the second ingredient to a successful side is, is is the togetherness. And I think that's that probably stood out more than anything with with those sides from sort of 2001 to 2005, that the, the um, friendships that was formed, the... Uh, you know, a lifelong, I suppose. We still stay in touch with a lot of them now and catch up with a lot of them now when, whenever we can. And, you know, don't get me wrong, talent is needed. But I think those two, um, those two ingredients or so parts of the of a successful side are very, very important. And I suppose that the biggest thing you can say about a team like that is how they react to, to disappointments. And I think losing in 2004 to Leeds, but then winning it the year after would just about sum that group up. Yeah, and, and I think the way we won it as well, I think we was the first team to come from seventh to actually win it. We went on, a, I think it was a 13-game winning streak to get there. So, um, But it felt surreal at the time it was happening. It was it was almost like it was fit. It was, um, didn't didn't think we was going to take the field and get beat. It just, just had one of those. You know, I've been in a couple of runs in my career where, um, you know, everything seems to go right for you. And that, that was certainly one of those. The sort of characteristics of that group is: Did you take that into to your coaching in terms of the groups you'd look to put together in different personalities and, and how different people would work off each other? Um, I think the one common denominator is obviously the work ethic. I think I think one thing, probably more so than than now, you know, we we enjoyed ourselves away from the, the field as well. You know, you could get away with a little bit more than mobile phones wanting every night club and one on every every in every bar. Um, so there was certainly an element of you know we played and celebrated after a win, but one one thing about that group was there was some incredible athletes that could that could finish two a.m. in the morning and still rock up the next day and, and rip in and um, put an unbelievable training session together, which is something I've never been able to do unfortunately. So I was tucked up in bed at ten o'clock. <laughs> Carl, I was one of those to... other ones. I was one of the two AM ones. Me, Reds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's. 
I don't know whether that's lucky or unlucky. <laughs> Here, you're, interesting you said that because obviously um, I was in there with the All Stars with Tim Sheens, and exactly what you've said there, Rad, is he, he says team morale is worth 30% more effort. So if you, and, and what he meant by that was if you're team morale and togetherness and you're all together uh, as one, when when the things get tough, he believes you'll give thirty you'll get thirty percent more effort out of your blokes than you will the opposition. And it's so true, isn't it? You know, if you just if if you're all on the same page, you all get on with each other. You just put that extra effort in for your for your teammate, eh? Yeah, and I don't I don't think there's any data that that there's no science behind that that backs that up. But it's it's through experience, I would hundred percent agree with that. I think. You know, one thing, um, what what was relevant when a team function was called, all the squad turned up and went out the way. And look, we, we was a squad, you know, four or five was from Wigan, a couple was from, from Widnes, you had a couple from Bull. You know, if a team event was called, there was a, it, it was it was almost unheard of if somebody didn't turn up or there was a really good reason for not turning up. Whereas, you know, recently, you know, we've had Mad Mondays, um, and, and five and six blocks have turned up, at, you know, over the over the years. And I just think, you know, what chance do you stand if, if, if socially you're not good together off the field and, and the togetherness is good off the fields? You know, I think I think those cracks appear when when you're on it. Certainly, yeah. I agree with that totally, mate. Uh, you know, it's I've been in teams that we've never ever been the best athletes or the best teams. And a prime example was back. Um, I think Canterbury had never bet uh, Auckland in about 75 years. Um, they had 14 Kiwi internationals, one being on the bench, and we had one in the Sini Marlo. Um, but Frank Endicott had created that culture in that, um, in that Canterbury team. Now, even if you weren't really playing too well for your club, he always selected you for Canterbury because he knew what he could get out of you and he knew what you'd bring to that group. Um, and, it, and it paid dividends when we bet Auckland for the first time in 75 years and, and won the cup. And then, you know, we, we nearly beat them every other year go after that. Um, and they were stacked with the with the national side, international team. So just that it, it does work. I, I'm with you, Rads. I firmly believe if you um, if you get the, the togetherness, the culture and everything and, and just them coming to training and enjoying it, you know, you don't want people turning up and, and they don't want to be there, um, you know. You've and it's hard for you guys as coaches to really keep that at a level because you've got them every single day, nearly. And and you're thinking, you know, what? How do you break it up? What you know? What do you do to break things up? And you know, instead of making it the same thing week in week out. Um, I think I think the, the length of the the season as well makes that really difficult as well. Obviously, you know, if you have a such, I think. 16, 7 or 17, 18, we, we ended up playing 74 games in um, two two seasons, which is an incredible, incredible amount of rugby. So there's definitely a, a need for changing the landscape, whether you, you're changing your training environment or the way you're training or, or even mixing your schedule up. I think trying to keep everybody um Interested and and like you say, coming into training with it, you do your best work with your smile on your face. I think you know there's a time obviously to, to knuckle down and frown, but I think you do majority of your best work when you're enjoying it. So um, hoping that they get off on being around one another um, can have a massive impact as well. Hey Reg, that that could probably lead us into the to the Joe Ridge when we were at, uh, you were at Hull. And mixing it up a bit, I remember you bringing your boys down to um, to train with us down at our facilities at Cantley Park, and you know it was a good session, good few sessions we had, and I think your boys enjoyed it, just seeing different faces, and then like for our boys, you had that um, I call it the helicopter, the drone or whatever above, <laughs> you know, filming the session, and you know our boys thought they knew then they had to sort of train well and they were real good tough sessions those and and i suppose that helped um, just changing the environment and stuff like that didn't it because talking about the dual reg a lot of people didn't get it reds but our two clubs myself you you know i left it to to you and uh, cookie and you and horny to to selection wise and players but 
we really, really, if you understood it, outside of those four walls, everyone was bagging it. But, you know, we really got it, didn't we, Reds? Yeah, I think we was fortunate, obviously, because of the, the relationships, obviously, you know, with yourself and obviously with the coaching set up. And I think I think it, it it definitely benefited us that obviously that Richard was in our full time environment as well. And and I you know we understood that that he had an obligation obviously to 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 select some of his part time players that that wasn't going to pick up a salary if they didn't get a pick that week. So it's uh, that was a really. I think it was a it, it, it's a tough scenario, but I think we did a real good job of it. Um, and there weren't so many discrepancies. Um, but we didn't hear too many drums beating at either end. I think our boys enjoyed coming down there and playing under the same calls and the same sort of systems. Um, and, and found it challenging as well. There were some some games we'd send boys down, and you know I, I was expecting them to really stand out amongst the crowd. But you know I think it's a credit. Um, to that division of how tough it was for some of them blokes, I think. But again, you know, the, the dual reg, I think I think there's a place for that 100%. Um, but I also think there's a place for reserves as well. You know, I think you can send your top end out dual regging. But I just think, um, you know, imagine if reserves was around now, would we be getting all these games cancelled due to COVID? Do you think I, I certainly think not? I think we'd be fulfilling fixtures, fulfilling our sponsorship ab- ab- uh, obligations. Um, well, that short-sightedness a few seasons ago has come back to bite us in the backside, unfortunately, and it will continue to do so until we get more players playing um, at a higher level. Hey, Reds, you, that's interesting, mate, because here, when I first when I first came over, I think there was about, I don't know, 20, 30, maybe more teams in the division we were in. What we had then is we had, all of them had a reserves, so... I don't know who, how it changed or what made it change or whose decision to change. But, you know, like the coaches used to then play, they play Wednesday, Thursday, leave two spots open in the first team for two subs to be picked out of those reserve grade games to play on the weekend. And every club had one. So where, where did it all change? Where did it all go wrong? I, I genuinely don't know. I, I was obviously part of, part of that um process where you where you're gunning for a bench spot, you know, you're trying your hardest to give it your best 20 minutes you possibly can to, to get on the bench on a weekend. Um for when I was 16 it was massive. We got 50 quid playing reserves and then 250 quid cash being on the bench as well for weekends. So yes. um yeah I, I obviously I wasn't involved in the in the decision process for that. But you know imagine that imagine that system now and imagine like I say imagine um a couple of COVID cases happening, would we have to cancel the fixture? I don't think we would. We'd be able to still fulfil these fixtures and it'd be a better standard of rugby than probably what we're seeing now, slinging 18-year-old debutants in a, you know, Hull, for example, one got in with, one got on the pitch with five minutes to go and the other one didn't, didn't get used, which tells you they're not probably quite ready yet. So, um, if they would have been exposed to a bit of an higher standard, a more physical standard of rugby playing reserves, would, you know, would they be further on than they are? I definitely think so. I wonder if it just all changed, you know, when they changed to the summer rugby, just try to change the format. But, you know, I clearly remember them days. That, and, yeah. and, you know, the thing is, Reds, nearly all the first team used to go and watch the uh, reserve grade games on the Thursday night or Wednesday night, you know, after training or whatever. You used to all make your way to the ground and and watch the game. And if you had an injury, you came back through that system. You had to have a twenty minutes in there to see if you were right for the weekend. You know what I mean? Didn't matter. Yeah, who massively. And it, and it was great for a young kid coming through to to you know to. I can remember playing Wigan at, at YPI. It must have been two thousand and eight, maybe. Uh, you know, Flecker was playing. Anthony Jelling was playing. Um, you know they had they had some real big big names playing, but amongst them was was a young George Williams coming through, and you know kids that a uh, Davis who's gone on to 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 you know bigger and better things, obviously. But for some of our young blokes to play against them was, was a fantastic opportunity. Um, I just think that's that's what the game needs to do, whatever it needs to do to to make that happen. It has to do it, whether that be you know give one of your overseas quarter spots. Places away and use that hundred thousand pound, whatever you're paying him to 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 finance the reserves. It's it's got to be done, and 
Um, the longer we don't do it, the more it's, it's going to out the game, unfortunately. Yeah, like I say, mate, we every club had one, and it's um, it's a shame that you know that these clubs. It is certainly for our club, you know, being a a one team club, it doesn't help at all. And you know, I sound like a broken record because I want to develop the club, and the next step of developing the club is is always having a, a reserve team and a and a women's team. But we're just not we're just not in a position to do that. Um, you know, uh, I do believe if we can get out of League One, we can accelerate the club uh, tremendously. And it's just a tough division we're in. But uh, you know, we had to we had to rely on these um, these dual reg partnerships uh, and and stuff like that because purely we've got no no reserve team. And years gone by, it didn't matter what division you were in, everybody had a reserve team. And so really, when you think about it, that's where the numbers of have really dropped off the cliff, haven't they, for, for our sport is, um, you know, because some blokes just used to bring their mates and all of a sudden they fell in love with it, played, and they ended up overtaking their mates, you know, getting in the first team before their, their pals. So, you know, it'd, it'd be nice if we could sort of try and redevelop that or get that back to um, to how it was. But, um, you know, we, I suppose, Rads, we just have to worry about our own clubs and, and let the powers that be make those decisions, eh? I think that's one of the problems. I think the powers that be are looking after their own clubs. I think that's what, you know, that's probably one of the big issues. I, I just, you know, like I said, I just think that there's going to be some short-term, short-term pain. Uh, initially, you know, it might have an impact on the amateur game. Um, it might take away a few numbers from the amateur game initially, but once it's up and running after a couple of seasons, the dropout from um, reserves to kids going back to amateur or even for the Champ One clubs, picking kids up that, that are showing promise in the reserves. You know, it's a great, it's a great um, recruitment tool for championship and Champ One clubs. And, and that's what it always was. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, we're a late developing sport, we're a late maturing sport, but there's no platform to play late. <laughs> You know, past 19, which is, I mean, you couldn't make it, well, you could make it up, but again, I couldn't talk about it, you know, until I'm blowing the face. It's a real frustration, man. I was going to say that we could we could debate this all day long. I, hey, I'll just, let's go to this. <laughs> I've got a funny one here for you, just to break it up a bit with the, when we had the dual reg. Obviously, with the dual reg, a lot of our fans got a little bit frustrated at, um, you know, that would have players and not have them, but what happened was a hundred percent genuine as you, you know, you and Rich or you and Cookie would speak, pick the players. Um, and then what happened is you guys had a real massive injury problem. So you had to keep them and they think, well, I thought the dual reds were ours and they, they, they weren't in our, our four walls where, you know, would say to you, we need X, Y, and Z position this week. You say, well, I've got available ABC. Well, we didn't need them. So without boring everyone and going into how it worked and how it didn't, I, I you know, for the for ours certainly the frustration was we wanted some players that we needed in positions and you needed them for you because of injuries. That's the that's the life of the dual reg. But where you could accommodate us, Reds, you always accommodate us one hundred percent. But we had one, <laughs> we had one here. You got me all all going, didn't you? You says uh Paulie, I've got um, we've got this uh, winger for you this year. This Fijian winger, um, <laughs> we brought him out of the army. He'll train with us, and um, he'll probably be with you just to see how he he goes and how he develops. Oh, Ratu Nalongo. Um, so I said, all right. He said, I'll I'll play him against you in the friendly. He scores an eighty meter. So me and Rich are like, oh mate, this this kid's with us after today. <laughs> So um, you kept them there for a bit, and then I think you had a few injuries. So Robbie, you might Robbie, you don't, I don't know if you know Reds. Robbie's a real pay to Wigan supporter, yeah, season ticket holder, everything. So I think was it you? You says I just I just need to pick him this week for us, and he scored a hat trick. Then he against Wigan. <laughs> so I says the horny. Did you see Ratu? Can't wait to get him. So we won't be getting him, mate. <laughs> True story, that Reds, isn't it? 
Yeah, it is, mate. I don't, I don't think he ever looked back, did he? He, he took to it like a duck to water. Um, <laughs> incredible, incredible athlete. I remember the try at, at your place. I think he brought centre field about 20 off our own try line. And, Kick off. Yeah, I've never seen anybody pull away so quick. Like, <laughs> it, it looked like everybody else had my boots on. So, no, he's a phenomenal athlete. And I think it's only a matter of time before he's probably in England set up in at rugby union. I think, you know, he's in serious consideration. So, as a credit to him and, and everything he does, I suppose. Hey, that's it then. So, obviously, um, you won your, your Challenge Cups um, with Hull. Great memories, mate. That obviously, we contributed to you to get there by you coming and playing at your second home ground at the keep mode. Um, <laughs> mate, I remember the second one. I, I got a bit emotional with you, didn't I, Rads? I, I got a bit upset when I seen you because I was buzzing for you. Um so they, they must have been great days, you know, the two Challenge Cup finals and, you know, been playing at Donny, winning them. And then, you know, you wanted the home change room. Me and you were having arguments with the opposition because you wanted that changing room. And we were saying that you're our jewel red, so you have our home changing room. That They tried to put you in the other one, didn't they? <laughs> it was ironic. It was obviously, you know, having both fixes there, it was... You know, we notoriously had a pre-season friendly there. We'd been down for some scrimmage games there. Our Joe Reds was there. So it, it literally was our second home. And, and the boys love playing there as well. It's, you know, you've got a fantastic facility there. and One that I'm pretty sure all would, would die for right now. Um, you know, their own little setup. But it was, um, yeah, two, two really special days. Two, two good games as well, I think. Two really strong games. Um, you know, the fact that we could train there. Um, prior, we did captain's run there both times, I think, as well. So it was, it almost was home from home, I suppose. I know, Rads, that you're a, a really, really proud man. Um, and when, we, we can't let you go or leave you without us touching on these uh, those Challenge Cup finals. Um, just what did it mean to you and your family, mate? Um, no, look, it was, it was huge. It was, it's probably, you don't, you don't reflect on it at the time. Um, but I think it's going to be a long while before a whole kid coaches a whole team to back-to-back Challenge Cup finals. I think I think that, that's never happened. I don't think in my lifetime. I don't think um, you know it'll happen for the rest of my life either. So that you know the the, the achievement was huge. Um, the, the feeling around the place was fantastic, and and it's you know something I always aspired to to doing when I became a coach. I wanted to see more kids pick up a ball in Hull. I wanted to see an influx of players in Hull um, get on board and get excited. And I just think those those cup wins, you know, had a small impact on that. I think I think there was a buzz around the place. Um, and obviously, you know, it goes back to what I'm saying, the more people we get playing, the more kids we get playing, the, the bigger our sport's going to grow. And, you know, we need our sport to grow massively. I think yeah, you I know- did right there, Reds, because... Um- if you look at look at the amount of Hull boys in the Hull team now, the local boys, which you know you you had a massive part of trying you know trying to achieve the the whole you know whole culture and from Hull and all the whole backroom staff and you know it, it, again that um, you, you know that effort that you get with them being local, um, you can't buy that, can you? No, and, you know, look, that was always one of my goals to get as many young old kids in the side as we can and, you know, very proud of the amount of debuts we gave. It, it took a hit, I think, when we went to the City of Hull. I think that was, a, again, a little bit of a short-sighted mistake. I think I think long-term, I don't, don't think there's been so many benefits of that. Um, but we did all right. You know, you have a look at the kids that's come through, even the kids that are playing at OKR now, you know, that we give debuts to, we, debuts to you. Your Dean Adlers, your Jez Littons, um, you know, we've 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 produced a few, and that's you know, some as a coach, I'm I'm really proud of. Mate, I knew I knew for a fact that those boys were was only a matter of time. We don't, you know, don't forget we had a lot of them uh, come with us on the Jewel Ridge partnership, um, and you knew, you know, those two you mentioned there, you knew Jesse was going to eventually get there at some stage. Um, all, all the boys that came through that system, and you're right, Hull KR and Hull, who you gave debuts to, um, yeah, they're, they're all going to be go on to have 
you know, really, really top class careers and make a difference for their clubs. Um, so that, you know, I know, I know you're proud of that Rads and, and you should be, to be fair. Um, obviously no one, no one probably knows um, how hard you work. I, I know yourself, Cookie and Horny, you're all anoraks, you know, you're, you're just dedicated to the sport. And this is what it means that supporters don't see. I, Reds, I don't think there's a harder working man in the game than you. Castleford are very, very lucky. Um, and if they just give you a chance, I know it took you some time to, you went into Hull and you had, you picked, you picked up a team. You had a lot of players there on big salaries who you had to live, live with and, and, and stay with for a couple of years. Um, but once you started turning it around, the, the proof's in the pudding, mate. And the, and you won two Challenge Cup finals for Hull FC. Castleford, I think if they, um, if they you know, and I'm, I'm not trying to tell them what to do. They can do what they like. But for me, if they give you um, the opportunity to stamp your mark on, they'll never get a, a harder working coach. And, you know, you can say that about Daryl Powell and all that. I'd, I've never worked with Daryl Powell. I worked with you for seven years, mate. And, and I never knew anyone who worked, I don't know anyone who works as hard as you as a coach. And, and I think, I think apart from you and your group, you, you, uh, you take responsibility for everything within the club, not just, not just the coaching. That's what I, I noticed with you. You, you try and, and, and take responsibility for nearly everything that's in your control, which is great. But I'm not. I'm not saying it because you're on here. I don't think people understand, and they need to know this: how hard Lee Radford would make. Honestly, I'll say it again. I don't know anyone who has the time. Or excuse me, language. Who, who one has the time? But you, you know, you've got family life, and you've got your own other stuff you do. But mate, you're a credit to, to any club that you go and coach. Um, you were going to go and coach in uh, in America, weren't you? In the other code. I did, yeah. I'd, I'd actually signed and agreed and was was ready to go. I had visa, um, went down to London for my visa application. That came through. Um, there was a couple of delays before that. You know, we were due to start pre-season in November, I think it was last year. Um, it got delayed till December, then back end of January, and obviously it was creeping up to the start of the season in the MLR. Um, and then literally, you know, a week before I'm due to go, you know the, the announcement got made that we're, we're going to enter the league in 2022. So that was a that was a real body blow, I suppose. I was I was looking forward to that. I, I'd sunk my teeth into it. I got to a couple of you know organisations, clubs, rugby union clubs, and had a had a look how they was doing things and picked as many brains as I could. You know that that I had um, access to um, and tried networking to get in touch with other blocks as well, just to see. You know what what similarities there is between the two sports, and obviously what differences there is as well. So, um, yeah, that that never came, and obviously in that in that time, you know, the Castleford job came up, and and that was one that appealed to me. You know, the club is um, it's a it's a big club. You know, it's it's the the ground itself has got that that old boulevard feel to it. It's 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 ancient, but it's got so much heritage there. I love love coaching there. I love playing there. Loved how close the supporters was to the ground and you know the pitch and the atmosphere. Um, and it's you know something I'm looking forward to obviously next season. Um, and I'm just hoping, like I say, I know I keep banging on about it, but all these restrictions and, and protocols that were you know you know yourself you're currently having to do at the moment. I'm hoping all them are going to be um, minimised. You know if not eradicated because um, it's been a tough couple of years for the sport and you know it's been a great year to have a couple of years to have a sabbatical out of the sport I think listening to one or two other coaches involved in it. Hey Reds um, just I think just explain to everyone I know that we spoke about it a couple of times and when you got offered this um, gig in America it sort of reinvigorated you and you, you, you got that little spring you said how did it come about? Um, a, a chap called Alan Clark, who was, who was coaching at Ospreys um, in 18, 19, I think it was, 2019, he, he came down to Hull um, for a week and just followed us and um, had a look at how we did things from a training perspective. 
a um, bit of a fact founding mission for for himself. And obviously, I you know struck a bit of a relationship with him, stayed in touch with him, and then at six seven months later, he got he got relieved of his duties as coach of Ospreys. So you know, I messaged him and said, look, if you ever want to come back down, you know, there's an invite here. We'll try and get you some accommodation if you want to get away from it all. And then six months after that. You know, I, I get relieved of my duties. So I get some message off him saying the same thing. So, I, you know, I messaged him and said, look, I'd love to have a catch up. I, I'm interested in union. It's, it's a route I'd like to explore. And then he rang straight away and said he'd just taken a sporting directorship role like Dallas, a new franchise. Um, would I be keen to go? And it was all done and dusted within a, within a fortnight, really. Unbelievable, mate. So... Knowing you, I bet you uh, had your head on the laptop watching Union game after Union game, did you? Literally, yeah. So it's, it was, you know, it's daunting, a bit scary. Um, it was a relief when I went to a couple of clubs. I just saw the similarities in some of the, the training techniques and drills. That, that put my mind at ease a little bit more because, you know, when you watch it, it's completely alien. Um, you know, some of the stuff that goes on on the ground and, the dark arts that work in them in them rooks and malls, it's um it's not something you're used to. So you obviously don't want to go there and make a fool of yourself either. Um so yeah, I tried picking as much up as I as I possibly could. And like I say, just just networking as much as I could and spoke to some great people. Um you know ex leagues but a but a couple of you know Stone Tribune Union coaches as well, um, which which I think are benefited from. I'll tell you what, mate, so just imagine if this COVID wasn't here, where where would you be? You'd probably be in America somewhere now, wouldn't you? Possibly, yeah. yeah. Possibly, yeah. It's, um, yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. It's, it's had, a, it's had a, an effect on every, you know, every every human being on the planet, I suppose, hasn't it? And it's, uh, you know, I can't wait to see the back of it. I'll tell you, Reds, I'm, uh, I'm a bit selfish, but I'm buzzing to see you. Uh, you know, I'm really pleased and buzzing to see you back in our sport. We lose, you know, we lose too many good people um, to the game. And I say it all the time. You've got people like Ellery Hanley just floating about, to, you know, that they've brought him back to in a bit now with the Super League. But I know for a fact, Al would, if, if he was asked, he'd love to do something with the academies and all that within the, the sport. You know, we've just, we've just lost... Um, Kevin Sinfield, he's going to um, to Leicester. Um, so to have to have you back, mate, at Cass. I, for me, I just wish you every success in the world. You're a you're a stand up guy. You're a you're a man of honour, and you know I'm sure that um, you'll bring some some big big good days to um, to that club, Red. So.